Hello, Anne, or welcome back to the Talking Wealth Podcast. I'm Dale Gillen, the Chief Analyst here at Wealth Within, and today we're going to be chatting about the keys to understanding risk in the stock market. But before we get into that, let me introduce my super fantastic co-host, Janine Cox. How are you today? Great. It's so nice to be with you today. Good well, on you I for love inviting chatting. me well, again. You're invited anytime. Am I your sidekick? No, I'm your, I think I'm your sidekick. <laughs> You're the one that says all the sensitive stuff and I'm the one that makes all the jokes, I think. Oh, fantastic. But I think people love the whole balance between you and me because you're sensible and <laughs> I'm controversial at times, you know, but at least they love that we talk from our heart, but they also you know, understand that we give the no BS approach to everything. So we don't try and fluff things up for people. And I think, True. you know, that's why our podcast is so successful. And as I was saying on another podcast, you know, we, we get over a million downloads a month a year and that's, know, just, that's just amazing like isn't it astounding and mm. it's like i know when we're talking to some of our experts on talkingwealth.com you know, so if you haven't if you haven't gone to talkingwealth.com get over there and there's some so many amazing videos but i know when we talk to some of our experts in the us and you know they get excited about five and ten thousand downloads in a month and i go <laughs> mate i said we get 120 <laughs> thousand and they're like, whoa. And we get more people from the US than, mm. than most of those people do. So if you're listening to us from anywhere else in the world other than Australia, a big g'day from Janine and I here in Australia. And we'd love to hear from you. So if you do have anything you want to talk to us about, send an email through to info at wealthwithin.com.au. But today we're going to talk about mm. risk. And I know this is an area that a lot of people just don't understand, do they, Janine? Exactly. And that, so many misconceptions about mm. risk and often leads people to make silly decisions or um, perhaps not make any at all. Okay. I'm going to ask the dumb question because <laughs> I'm really good at asking dumb questions. Yeah. And it's amazing, I, you know, even in business meetings, you know, I walk out and mm. my wife would say, why did you ask that question? I said, well, I didn't understand the word, so I thought I had to ask. Mm. If I'm in a meeting, I need to understand the word. So I'm good at asking the dumb questions, but sometimes the dumb question is the most important one to ask. What is risk? Risk. Mm, risk can mean many things to different mm. people. Mm -hmm. I think for me, risk was more about thinking about well, what is the risk rather than, um, you know, what is the risk to me? What is the risk to my money? It's, it's just about whether I'm going to be able to invest in the stock market mm -hmm. and then actually walk away with my money at the end of it. So mm. when, when I first began in the stock market, there's that risk and then there's the risk, well, um, if I do nothing, yeah. then I'm not going to go anywhere. So that's another risk in itself. Oh, yeah. There's two sides of it, isn't it? it? Yeah, because you could go on in life and you could be earning money and then you're not actually gaining any, um, you know, additional growth from the all that hard work and that e energy that you put into it and you're making other people rich by spending your money, yeah. but you're not actually growing what you've got. So there's a time risk in there for people as well. Yep. But, I mean, I think the GFC to me sort of really emphasises what risk is about. So risk yeah. is can be something that you ab absolutely have no idea that you're taking a risk, so you're actually blind to any risk. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that the GFC really illustrated it for a lot of people in that what risk is about. Risk is about, um, you know, you could potentially be sitting on an investment today and then you're sitting on much less of it tomorrow. Mm. Um, and that's really the thing that you've got to try to mitigate in the stock market when you're investing your money is to make sure that it actually grows rather than goes backwards. But at times your, your investment will go up and it will go down at times and that's okay, mm. but it's just whether you're actually able to grow that over the long term that's the important thing. Yeah, I mean risk is, is has many tentacles, I suppose, if I mm. want to put it in that uh, sense. And I know the, the, probably the important thing that you brought up is there's two sides to risk, the risk of doing something and the risk of not doing something. And all too often people don't look at that side of it. They only look at risk of doing something mm. rather than not doing something. Because if you don't if you don't put your money at risk, you don't get as rewarded as much. If you can go into a bank turn deposit, which is pretty much zero risk, but you know, one percent interest rate is not that exciting, especially when inflation's at seven or eight percent. You know, yeah. you're going backwards at rates of not. So is risk not taking any risk doing doing you um, well, and then this answer it's no. So, but I also know I read a I read a poem many 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 years ago, and I only read it once, but I could never find it again. And it was all about risk, and it was saying, basically, it said it, the last line was says, "If you risk nothing, you have nothing." Mm. 
And But the whole poem went on to say, well, every day you take risks. Every day you get up out of bed and walk out the front door, you take a risk because when you walk out that door, you risk being, mm. you know, confronted by somebody or an uncomfortable situation. You risk being in a motor vehicle accident. You risk falling over, hurting yourself. You risk being rejected by a boss or a partner. You, re- you risk all sorts of things. But we take those calculated risks. Mm. And the more we take the risk, the more comfortable we get with them. And we can manage the risk. And that's all we're saying with the stock market is you just got to have those strategies to manage that risk because all too often we see that negative side that you were talking about, like, you know, what if I lose money? And then people go, well, what if you do lose money? Well, what's the worst that can happen to you? Mm. And why would you lose a lot of money in the stock market? Because if you understand what risk is, then you can mitigate risk, which we'll talk about as we go along. Is there anything else so you want I to add to it? You need to come back to why would you want to take a risk? Mm. So that's a really big one, isn't it? In Everybody wants place. a reward. Everybody wants that. That's right, at the end of it. Mm. So you've got to be prepared to take some risk and how much risk do you want to take? And I think the thing that I didn't understand about the stock market when I first started is that that I really could control that risk in you terms can. of how much risk you're willing to take. Mm. And and it's not until you actually have traded the stock market and, you're, and you've actually... Tr- put a strategy in place and and manage that process that you really get that. And even mm-hmm. if somebody just put a few dollars into the stock market, mm-hmm. I think their overall understanding of the risk would be better because things like yeah. walking out your front door, getting into your car, we all sort of take that for granted. And I see what you're saying mm-hmm. about that. But it's, it's what are the things that are closest to you, like the risk of, for example, um, you know, falling off a build. I mean, there are risks every day that people are taking, as you say, but... For, pe- for some people, the risks are really not in their faces because we drive our car and we think, oh, yeah, that's just something I do every day. I know how to get from A to B, drive my car. But it's necessity sometimes. But there's a risk of running out of fuel, but we check the, the meter to make sure that we're not going to run out of fuel. But then someone who's working on a building site, you know, the risks mm-hmm. are really in their face, so it's all about safety. And so I think someone who's perhaps – I think – um, tradespeople are much more likely to be aware yes. of that sort of risk, obviously, in their in their job, and so therefore may be able to pick it up easier in the stock market. Um, that's actually a really good thought because I think that tradespeople would be really good traders if they're in a in an, an environment where they have to look at risk in their day to day job. Well, I know we do have a lot of um, armed forces people doing you know, our course and getting in the stock market and they love it because they take on risk all the time and they understand that. Yeah, so. that's right. Yeah, I agree with you. Mm. So I think from that point of view, um, you know, it's really about adjusting your mindset to, to the fact that there is a risk and then just saying, well, okay, how much is – if there? If I know that I'm taking a risk for a reason, then how much risk am I willing to take mm. and how can mm. I mitigate that risk and what do I need to do to be able to – to do that and it's about acting at certain times mm. um, making those decisions and that's how you control it but it's like you said in the past it's about people trusting themselves to be able to do that as well that's all right let's see if we can help people today mm. now janine i'm going to ask you a question okay, okay. So it's going to get personal oh yeah get, <laughs> it's gonna, we're going to get down and dirty right here okay did you bring an umbrella to the office yeah no well you know, when you left your car, you took the risk of getting rained on. Like it's, it's raining. It's in my car. Ra- it's raining right now. It is too. I uh, you walked it. out of your car without an umbrella. That's right. So you took a risk that you, your hair might go frizzy. <laughs> which it will. So, as which, soon as my hair gets a little bit of dampness on it, it just sticks straight out. So lucky you got Good into look. the studio in front of these cameras before. Oh, I would have loved that. Yeah, <laughs> that would have been, been nice brilliant. having a risk. But that's the thing is that's what we do. We, mm. we make judgments. Every single day, don't we? Like mm-hmm. we go, okay, well, I pulled up here, I parked my car, here's my car going to be safe here. Oh, if I've got to walk over here. And women take that stuff in their mind. Um, I say men take their safety for granted, mm-hmm. where women don't when they're parking cars. And, you know, women then do, okay, where am I parking my car? How far do I have to walk and what time is the day? And all those so things. So you're saying I'm going to park straighter than you in the car park? So I I'll make sure my car's I did not say. I didn't say you could parallel park better than me. Then I'm looking at the risk that someone's going to hit my car or I'm going to hit someone else's car. No, I'm not talking about that. You're, very stere- <laughs> you're stereotyping now. You better be careful. I'm just saying women think risk yeah. more than men and re- women mm. tend to be a little bit more risk adverse than men and rightly so in certain circumstances. You know, I don't have an issue mm. with that. I mean, a, a lady walking alone at night, yep. you know, I can imagine what 
does go through their mind. Whereas me as a guy, I have the freedom of not necessarily thinking so much about that. So, mm. you know, that's the, I suppose, the good so you, thing. So this is a compliment is what you're saying. Yeah, I'm giving it as a compliment. But we also find in the stock market and when it comes to investing, that nine times out of ten, the, the lady is far more risk adverse than the man. Mm. The man is a little bit more of a risk taker. It's just the way we're biologically made up, I think, in our thinking. And, mm. um, you know, but to me is it doesn't mean you shouldn't take risk. And you took a risk to getting out of your car without your umbrella, so you might have got frizzy hair. So that mm. happened. But, again, it worked out this time. But you might you still have to get back into your car, though. So <laughs> you might have frizzy hair on the way home. But mm. at this point in time, it's pretty good. But to me, risk is whatever you make it. And there's different levels of risk from mild risk to extreme risk. And it's okay to take risk, but I find too many people in the stock market overdo risk Mm -hmm. in terms of they either overdo it in terms of they don't get into the stock market Mm -hmm. because they're fearful of it so much, or they do completely the opposite of they take way too much risk Mm. and they buy cheap, crappy stocks that they've read about on a chat forum or seen on a YouTube channel or whatever else, or they try and trade FX and I think... The amount of people that we get talking to us who want to trade FX is just mind-boggling because mm. as soon as you start typing in, you know, trade the stock market, you just get bombarded with these FX providers and people think the biggest, brightest, smartest people in the world and the biggest organisations in the world, they're the ones that run the FX market and yet what makes some young guy think he can beat them? Yes. With no education. So if we can look at it this simply, okay, yeah. So our need in one sense to feel safe or yep. for the ones who take big risks to um, experience whatever that is that they feel like they want to experience overrides their values of thinking that the stock market may be risky or they shouldn't be risking mm. a lot of money. Okay. So that, that emotional need is driving those decisions. Correct. So forcing them to take higher risks or not to take any risks at all. Yeah, and to me mm. there's a balance. There's a way to mitigate risk or mean ensuring you're not taking too much risk and also not too little risk. Yep. So how about we get into what risk? We've been sort of generally talking about what risk mm. is, but when it specifically comes to the stock market yes. and investing, and I will use the word investing, not necessarily trading because it's the same for both, um, we have a couple of types of risk, which I talk about in my first book, How to Beat the Managed Funds by 20%. Mm. And if you haven't got that, you can still get that for free. You just got oh, to pay the shipping. Oh, is that the, the graph you're talking about that shows the stock? Specific? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I love so, that graph. so there's a graph in there. I explain the two types of, the major two types of risk you need to be looking at. And again, you know, just go to our website, wealthwithin.com.au, and you can order the book for free. You just got to pay the shipping. Um, and I talk about two types of risk. And one is market or systemic risk. Mm. Do you want to explain that to people? Yeah, because the market risk side of things, Everybody used to talk about, okay, you just buy, just keep buying stocks and building up your portfolio. Yeah. But when was enough stocks? When's I mean, enough? You know, that was the one of the th- bits of information that was missing many? when I first started looking at the stock market. And so then this graph, you know, just was amazing to see that graph because it actually gave you a sense of understanding, well, too much is enough, you know, it's too much. You just you need to stay away from the stocks once you've got a certain amount because really it's about diminishing returns after that. It's mm. just you're not really getting any sort of benefit for it. You're just gathering all of these stocks and it's creating a bigger job. Like, you know, you've talked about in other podcasts how people made a big job of it, of the stock market investments for themselves rather mm. than making it simple. But then when you see the other side of the graph, which is the curve that goes up and you're looking at the risk is high at the bottom end in mm. terms of the, the least number of shares that you might have in your portfolio. That's the highest level of risk that you could take if you say only had, maybe if you got one share as an example, then you're taking maximum risk because all of your risk is in that one stock. Everything relies on that stock going up. Mm. That's hugely gambling, but it's about balancing that curve out so that you're taking less risk, but you're still going to be taking a risk, but you're just sort of being able to get potentially better returns by when you, your stock picking, um, you know, and in, in the timing of when mm. you're doing it is but right. What you're talking about now is much more the second type of risk, not the first time. Yeah. So you're talking a bit more about specific risk. Um, well, but well, market, market risk is risk of the system. Okay. okay. It's the risk of the market. So you're not talking market. about systemic risk. Well, it is systemic risk because that's yeah. the systemic risk or market risk is the same thing. It's, well, with the systemic yeah. risk, that's where you can have that flat line almost on the graph. Um, yeah, but no, systemic risk is risk 
risk of the market that you're investing in. You inherently, as soon as you buy okay, one so house. Okay, so you're talking bigger picture. Yeah, I'm talking ecro. I'm talking okay. macroeconomics. I'm talking about governmental risk. If government changes regis- legislation right. or regulation, I'm talking about if the interest rates go up or down. I'm talking about mm. if there's a war, if there's, um, you know, you're talking about the stock market itself. If you buy one stock, mm. you're taking on stock market risk. If the stock market crashes or uh, Because booms. that sort of thinking, though, is what drives people to think that they have to then go and invest in overseas markets. Well, they don't. It's part of that thinking. Well, they think about that, but then is that, then that gets into modern portfolio theory, mm. which we can discuss a little bit about, um, you know, as we go through this podcast. But market risk, and this is the real, real critical point that I have in my book, my first book, How to Beat the Managed Funds by 20%, is market risk cannot be diversified. Mm. You just can't do it. As soon as you buy one house in one suburb, you've taken on the risk of that suburb. You can't That's diversify right. that by buying a second house. It's the same risk. Mm. You can't buy, if you buy one stock in the Australian stock market, you don't diversify market risk by doing two stocks because no. you've still got the same market risk. And you can't diversify that by going into the US market because mm. it's not an unrelated market, you know. Mm it's still a stock market. So you're still taking on market risk in there. And this is one of those things that people don't realise. And you, as you said, you know, they're buying lots and lots and lots of stocks. You're not diversifying market risk. Every time you buy another stock, you're getting taking more, on more. You're getting, taking on more. But one of the, the, probably one of the key statements I have in my first book, How to Beat the Managed Funds by 20%, is that you don't get twice the benefit from holding 40 stocks than you do from 20 mm. and you don't get twice the benefit holding 20 than you do from 10 mm. or twice the benefit from holding 80 than 40. You just don't. Mm. So you're not increasing the benefit. You're just increasing market risk, which and is- And your com- workload. And your workload, mm. you know. So market risk is inherently inherent in whatever you buy. So if you buy a term deposit, you're taking on market risk. Actually, you- one of the things that I think hit home on one of our yeah. live shows was how we showed- uh, some graphs of the overseas markets and yes. our market having a major correction and when that happened, and they all happened around the same time. Yep. So people were thinking that they could actually um, sort of, I guess, balance out the risk of our market by buying into other markets, not knowing that those markets correct well, that's, around the same that's time. that's pretty poor advice, isn't it? Mm. And the thing is we, we know that's the case, but they do that for a, a for really, really good reason is because a lot of the big end of town – can't put all the money into the Australian market mm. while artificially inflated. So they say, let's invest overseas. Yeah. So they tell you to do it to make it all right for them. Mm. So that was market or systemic risk, which is the one type of risk that we talk about. Again, you can't diversify that. The other one I want to talk about is specific risk, which is really what you were starting to talk mm. about a few minutes ago. What's is What specifically is specific risk? About the risk but in, in terms of the individual stocks, the company, um, what are their operations, what's happening with them? If the company is delisted, that's obviously mm-hmm. um, means that you've potentially lost your money. It's the risk of the share price falling for that individual stock. And specifically, if you invest all your money in, say, one, two, three, four shares, then your risk, your portfolio is so concentrated that your risk is, um, you know, you've got 25% of your risk in each of those individual shares if you've got four shares, mm. which is not really well spread. Um, as yeah, we I know. know. I know the big end of town, you know, they want you to have lots mm. in your portfolio. They, they want you to trade more. They want you to trade more. Um, and, and that's really what they want to do. But then they really do poo-poo concentrated portfolios. And they try to discredit mm. people who talk about concentrated portfolios and in essence, in their terms, not our, my, not my thinking, and definitely not yours as well, is their thinking is we do concentrated portfolios, which we don't. Mm. And the premise is is we looked at modern portfolio theory, and I studied it a lot to look to take the best parts out of it. A modern portfolio was designed around managed funds; it wasn't designed as in for individual investors. Yeah. And yet we're bombarded with the theories from that that don't work that well anyway. Mm. Even for managed funds, they don't work that well. But specific risk to really bring it down, and rightly so, as you said, you know, it's risk of that company. It's risk or it's specific risk to that company. Is that company going to go broke? Is it mm. going to make money? So when you buy, if you put all your money in one company, that's 100% of your risk is in one company. Yeah, you want to have so, a higher level of and that's confidence a high level that that's of going risk. to go up. That's not smart, as no. you said. 
you got two, then it's mm-hmm. halved to three, then it's in thirds. And as you said, 25% if you've got four stocks. Mm-hmm. But that's where that curve comes into it that you're talking about, or the graph that's in my book, um, How to Beat the Managed Funds book. It starts to bottom out. But at what point does it bottom out? And when you get 10 stocks in your portfolio, well, it's a 10%, isn't it? Mm. We're now no longer 50 or 100% or 25%. We've now got 10% risk on any one stock that goes broke. If one mm. stock in your 10 stocks goes broke, the most you're going to lose is 10% of your money. But what's the chances of that? But what's the chances of that? It's very, very low. Especially if you stick to the big stocks. Correct. Mm. But a bottom line, it flatlines from just past that. So around about 12-ish stocks, it actually flatlines. It's mm. around, it's a lot less risk. And from that point on, the incremental advantages of having more stocks in your portfolio is so min- minute, it's not funny. Mm. And as we talked about earlier, the more stocks you buy, the more market risk you have. So when you get into having portfolios of 20 stocks yep. and 30 stocks or 40 you're stocks. You're not improving your returns. You're not improving your returns. You're mm. actually squashing downside risk and upside risk of your portfolio return, but then all you're doing is just following the market. Mm. And I don't know about you, Janine, but I don't think I've met anybody who just wants to average the market. Look, there are a lot of investors, we can't say anybody, but there's lots of investors who would like to just average the market, but at the end of the day, they just don't want to lose whatever they make. But I mean, let's face it, it's not possible Mm. not to lose on some trades. You will lose on some trades over time. I think the issue is that people mm-hmm. think, okay, they don't want to average the market, but what do they really want then? Like, is it that they want 10, 20%? I mean, and how well, much risk are more. they willing to take for that? Well, what they're doing is they're buying and holding and they're buy- mm-hmm. buying lots of stocks. And I've never seen one of those portfolios where there wasn't a number of stocks in big losses, mm. you know, and that drags your portfolio returns down. And so what we talk about, and, and I know in our, our another podcast when we talk about getting started in the stock market, we talked about people being active. I'm not talking about every day. We're just talking about being a little more active and looking at your portfolio on a regular basis and making adjustments and not buying and holding. So by having eight to 12 stocks, you're minimising risk but giving yourself more chance of getting a better return. Mm. And that's really why that concentrated portfolio, in, in, can I say inverted commas, because as mm. the industry like you to have 20 plus stocks, but having eight to 12 is where it flat lines between mm. risk and reward. You don't get any less risk, but you still get the reward Yeah, because you're able to ease. Anybody can manage eight stocks or 10 stocks or 12 stocks. Anybody can do that. Even a 12-year-old can do that. Mm. Um, and just using the rules in my book, you can manage that and we get constantly emails from people who are getting good returns just by following the rules in the book. I'm just thinking about mm-hmm. risk and thinking that the, the degree of risk is rising as the, the rain mm-hmm. gets heavier that my hair is going to I was going to say, you're going to be happy. Aren't you? Standing on its end here. The risk that you're going to have frizzy <laughs> hair when you walk out I'll of this. I'll take a photo of you and I'll text it to you, okay, so you can yes. see. Frizzy hair Janine on the way. <laughs> no way. That's the good part about being a guy. I just shake my head and it all falls off. Yep. So, just get yeah. out of the shower and it's done. I just get out of the shower thing. and done. But it's mm. fine. But, I mean, it's nice that we're having some rain. We haven't had rain for a little while and we're in, obviously not in a soundproof. You just have to speak louder. You're good at that. I do, but we're not in a soundproof studio. Um, but we will be soon <laughs> as we build them. But at the moment we're not in one though. So we talked about systemic risk or risk of the system, mm. the risk of the stock market, government, et cetera all that macroeconomic type of stuff, the world going into meltdown, those sort of things. We talked about specific risk, which is specific to the investment, mm. whether that's a stock, whether that's a pop property, whether that's a bond, whether that's an ETF, whatever it is, that's specific risk. Yes. And this is where, can I, can I actually bring up ETFs here? Because you, you know that's a bugbear of me. Because people think, you know, by buying an index ETF that they're diversifying their risk. Mm. And I go, How? And they go, well, that ETF invests in 100 companies or 200 companies. And I went, and how are you diversifying your risk? Mm. You bought one ETF. Mm -hmm. And they go, yeah, but they invest. I said, I don't care what they invest in. Mm. You're investing in one ETF. And that's one company that you're putting all your money into. So specific risk is 100% in my book. Because if that company goes broke, what are your chances of getting your money back? If that ETF, they pull it off the market, what's the chances? Now, the chances are generally pretty good because obviously the rules and regulations mm. around these. But the point is that risk is one. Just the same as I put all my money in BHP or other Okay, stuff. so it's, it's more about market risk then. 
Yeah, right? that's all they get. Is, so they're getting market risk. Correct. So therefore, they need to really understand what the direction of the market is if they're mm. going to do that strategy. That's no, I'm talking about point. index ETFs. I'm not talking – an index ETF mm. is no more diversified – or safe or lower risk than somebody has an eight to twelve, eight to 12 stocks but in the You and portfolio. I have different thinking about this and you know that. So you just opened a can of worms so that you would just rev me well, up. I'm waiting for you? the pink boxing gloves to come out for you to smack me in the ding, ding, ding in the round three. <laughs> but you won't do that. Um, but well, I will have something else to say if you'll let me. <laughs> okay, I'll shut up. Okay, so the next point that I want to make is about the ETFs, mm. is that even though that you've got one, as you say, investment, mm and yep. that you're invested across a whole lot of different shares across the market, and it could be other things in the ETF, but let's just assume it's shares at the moment, mm -hmm. and that you've got all the market risk. If you can just understand that direction of that market, mm -hmm. there are advantages in a, in a sense for investors yeah. in that because we've, we say to people that you can analyse a market, currency, commodity, um, stock. Yeah. Or you analyse it all the same way. So if you can analyse a market and work out where it's going and you can potentially treat the market like you would trade a stock, then you could invest in an ETF and understand when you have to be in and out. Yeah, but it doesn't give you lower risk than hold, and holding a share because you're just saying treat the ETF like a stock and I agree with that. But why would you buy an index ETF when you can get better returns by holding 10 of the top 20 stocks? Well, you've proven that over time. I've proven mm. it time and time again, both in our market and the US market. Mm. So it's like, to me, it's like, why would you bother doing something that's going to get you less return but not lowering your risk? Yeah, but you're in that moment, right? You're not mm -hmm. thinking about what's simple for people. I mean, you've made it really simple, I you must say. Buy, everybody can buy 10 stocks. Yeah, that's it. I mean, I think the Anybody that can buy the top 10 way, stocks on the marketplace mm, or the top 10 of the top 20. But it's when people think, oh, I've got to buy 20 or 30 stocks. No. I could never do that. Well, you don't need to is the point you're making. Correct. Can we move on now? Can yeah, you put so the boxing gloves I'll, away? I think I'll let you go now. Okay, I think you need to go and get your umbrella too because <laughs> it's getting a little bit noisier in here. Yeah. Liquidity risk. I know this one's really – this is a – I was going to say a bugbear boy for you and me, but we see so many people break this, it's not funny. It's one of the biggest ones they break all the time is liquidity. They go for low liquid stocks. Yes. With what I call the buy and pray method where they buy something and just pray it goes up. Yeah. And then when it doesn't, then they ring us up and say, I bought this stock at this and now it's this, what should I do? And yeah. to me, that's the question you ask before you buy. But anyway, you can explain liquidity risk. Well, right now, should I hope and pray that the rain stops? Do you Absolutely. think that might work? Um, mm. Because I, I'm, I sort of feel like, imagine we're out on a football field because I know yeah. you love the topic of footy. Yeah. And we're out on this football field and, and what's the risk of getting rained on? <laughs> and you'd look like a drowned rat and so would I. Thank you. Well, I used to look like a drowned rat when I was playing football because yeah. I used to have longer hair. But anyway. Now, what was your question? I was talking about liquidity risk. Yes. Okay, so what is liquidity risk? Liquidity risk is when you, well, in my mind, I'm looking at an individual stock yep. to start with and having a look to see whether the stock's liquidity is high enough to justify whether I can actually put money into it without actually affecting the price movement of the share. Okay. So if... If the stock, and we have different guide, guides for the value and volume of any particular share, so it's a volume of units traded mm -hmm. and the value of the stock, as you know, um, where the, there's a sort of a minimum at the bottom where you wouldn't want to go any lower than that because you're talking about getting into really illiquid type shares that yep. we, we, we sort of warn investors to stay away from. But when we're talking about liquidity, we're, we're talk, saying, okay, you can look at the top 20 shares. They're really big liquid stocks. And you can actually go and have a look and see what their market value is. So we're talking billions. So if you go and look at the mm -hmm. value of those shares and look at the value of smaller shares, you can really get an appreciation for the fact that there's chalk and cheese we're mm -hmm. talking about, just yep. looking at it that simply. Because anybody can go and look on market index and have a look and see what the market capitalization of two okay. different shares are to understand the liquidity of those shares, but the risk side of it comes in terms of the volatility that then mm -hmm. happens as a result of that low liquidity. So with the big blue chip shares, what's the chances of um, Commonwealth Bank going up 20% in a week? It's yes. very slim. Um, you know, you might see it go up 5% um, as could be quite okay for Commonwealth Bank, but to see it go up 20% week after week wouldn't be you know, something you just generally wouldn't see. Whereas when you're looking at some of the small stocks, you might see that happen for a period of time 
and mm. that is the sort of the high liquidity. You could even see a stock jump 30% in, in a small stock. But the problem is that those stocks will go up fast, but they can also come down extremely fast. So low li liquidity risk is all about being able to buy a stock that mm -hmm. actually you can have confidence that it's going to go up, but it's not then going to turn around and burn you at the end. those big moves on those low liquid stocks mm. because they're low liquid. And what I mean by that is if, if you've got 20 people wanting to buy a 10 cent stock and only mm. one person wanting to sell it. You're not going to be able to fill it. In, mm. Well, correct. So whoever bids the highest price gets the, the trade. Mm. So whereas BHP or you know, Commonwealth Bank and it's not, Which it's is not the fine issue if there. there's loads of buyers in there and you're trying right. to sell. But, but often, often when somebody says to us, you know, can you have a look at this stock for us and it's a low liquid stock, we mm. go, okay, get your calculator out and multiply the volume by the share price. Mm. And sometimes it's in the tens of thousands of dollars. Now, if they're putting $5,000 into a stock that only trades at $25,000 a week, mm. they've just taken up one-fifth of all the trading in the week. Yeah. And that's just way, way too low liquid and unacceptable because people, you'll always be able to buy a stock if you put the right price in, mm. but you won't always be able to sell it. That's right. And you won't always be able to get a buyer for that stock because it's not, there's an old thing in the stock market, the one more fool theory. If you've got something that's pretty poor investment, mm. you've got to find one more fool to buy it off you at a mm. higher price than you paid, which is not always the case. Mm. So liquidity risk is a risk that you can get in and get out without moving the market. Mm. That's really what you were saying before, yeah? Well, what I was saying mm. is it's not exactly that. I was getting towards that, but it's more about mm. understanding the liquidity is a direct mm. reflection on the volatility and the same thing, whether, whether someone can get in and out of a stock is part of it, mm. but it's also about being able to trade something and have your mind um, mm. ready for that because so people who are new and beginners to the stock market, if they try to trade stocks that are have a low liquidity, yep. they're going to jump around more and it's going to be a different experience for them, if, yeah. especially if the stock tanks. Because we've seen so many examples on our live show where stocks have gone up in brilliant fashion, these lower liquidity shares, yeah. and that have fallen in much less time. And the, the individuals who are trading those shares, it's too fast for them to be able to understand to make judgment because their brain is still in the fact that this stock's just gone up, you know, 20, 30, 40%, even though it's just corrected. Uh, they're mm. now worried about whether they're going to be able to, you know, get out with a profit and thinking, oh, I'm just going to stay in the stock and hope it goes back you're, up again. What you're talking it's now just, is more volatility risk. But it's, it's volatility, but liquidity and volatility are really closely linked. They are. And really closely linked to the psychology of traders, whether they're experienced or whether they're beginners, but it's far worse for beginners okay, uh, when they're dealing with here. that. So we've, we're, we're crossing between liquidity and volatility risk here at the moment, which yep. is fine. I don't have a problem with going off track all the time. Mm. But it's so, not off track for yeah. me because you can't have one without Correct. the other. That's why I'm mm. quite happy to go with you on this one. To me, let's say, okay, <laughs> we've got a trader that's bought a stock for a dollar. It's gone up to $2 mm. in three weeks or four weeks, whatever it is. And now it's turned around and come back to $1.50. So what is that person thinking? That person's thinking, oh, my goodness, I, I had that money and now all of a sudden it's just gone. So they're thinking they've lost 50 mm. cents, not gained 50 cents. Correct. So that's what you're saying. Mm -hmm. And that's really what I'm, I was getting at with this whole volatility risk because people think, I have this thinking that if my money's in the market. It's not yours. It's not mine mm. because I don't control it. Mm -hmm. And people go, what do you mean it's not your money? And I went, well, it's not my money. I'm not controlling. All I can control is to buy or sell. That's it. So if my money's, I've bought shares, then the market's in control of the money. They're in, yep. that, the market's in control of whatever the price of that share is every second of every day. So I need to treat it as it's not my money until it comes back into my bank account. Mm. But too many people think, well, because it's gone to $2, that, oh, I've lost 50 cents per share now. Well, no, you haven't. No, You've but first go back a step because they think when it's gone to $3 mm. that they've actually, that's their money. That's what I was just saying. No, but then you said when it, if it falls back, that, that they've lost it. That they've lost their money. Correct. But and what it's not you're basically their money. saying it was never theirs. It was in the never theirs in the first place. Yeah. So, but then they go, okay, well, if it gets back up to two dollars or three dollars, I'll sell it then, mm. because they think I need to get that money back, the mm. money that was never theirs. They need to get that back, and yes, and to me that's again wrong thinking, and that's with mm. the volatility risky because it gets you, when you have a big win, it can get you lead you into overconfidence. It can lead you into a false sense of security that you mm. think you know that you know rather than you actually know that you know. 
So there's a whole range of things Look, that I know that you that. like to tell people when they're wrong. Um, I also tell them when they're wrong. <laughs> so, but for me, it's more about thinking that that, if you were to look at a scale of, of mm. you know, on zero to 10, and you, if that's the way you think, where am I on the scale of being experienced in understanding risk and, and trading? So if, if that's how you feel about a share in terms of the way that it's moved, then you're really down the low part of that scale. Yeah, but if you ask that person, they would probably think they're a seven or eight out of 10. Yeah, because they've just made a huge profit, but where's it gone? Well, know? where's it gone? Correct. Yeah. But that's the thing is, is when we ask, when I've asked traders, where do you think you are mm -hmm. on a scale of one to 10? They always give me a high number and then I go, okay, so compare yourself to Janine where you are and mm -hmm. the number comes dramatically down. Yep. Because now I'm giving them a comparison of somebody who actually knows what they're doing. Mm. So, so to me, there's, and this is nine times out of 10, people just get it wrong. Well, when they're in the trade, mm -hmm. okay, and that stock's coming back, yeah. I guess the trader is, is the one that's got the experience to know, and depending on your level of skill and knowledge, mm -hmm. that if it comes back, there's a chance that it could keep falling. Yep. There's a chance that it could just go sideways and give you your exit, or yep. there's a chance that it could keep, it could still drop and give you your exit, or it could just turn around and go back up. Good, good. Right? So there's those ways okay. of thinking but the beginner has no idea and i think it's that mm. uncertainty side of it um yep that then makes them part of the risk equation they are they're part yeah. of the risk equation i mm. agree now i'm going to throw a, a left to field one concentration risk at you okay so i have a i i can't concentrate half the time <laughs> so um, concentration risk when you're talking about a portfolio what are we talking about there concentration risk oh look that's about having a few, few, the fewer shares that you have in a portfolio is considered to be a concentrated portfolio. Yep. So it's more about having that specific risk around the individual shares in that concentrated portfolio. I'm going to take it one step further by mm. saying, how many times have we seen people that just have lithium stocks? Oh, yeah. Or just have Bitcoin or a few cryptos. So or concentrated to a particular area of the even market. Even more concentrated mm. than that to an area. And if that area just goes belly up, it's just gone their portfolio. Which lithium is a good example of that. Lithium is a great example. And a lot, a lot of people had tech stocks back yeah. in 2021. Oh, gosh, that's a better example. 2022, tech just fell out of bed. Yeah. And all these people that thought they were great traders mm. ended up in the doghouse by mm. the end of 2022 because they'd lost so much money on some of these tech stocks that mm. they thought were brilliant. Yeah. the year before so that's to me mm. you've got to look at that and, and look at your market risk your specific risk but not have be too concentrated in one area or not be too concentrated in being have too little shares in your portfolio yeah. and there's that's a way of advice. building up your portfolio that we do teach people so i want to move on to strategies to help people mitigate risk in the stock market unless you've got another risk you want to talk about like the <laughs> risk of dale over talking about something <laughs> no yeah. the risk of your ears going red Listen, my ears, they do all the time. Because I can see them. You can't hide them under your hair. Like I well, I'm, I think I might get a pair of headphones so you won't be able to see them <laughs> at all. So are you okay if I move on to some strategies to mitigate yes, risk? Yes, that would be awesome. What I want to do is talk about them in terms of what we're often told by the big end of town or the mm. marketplace. You know, if you just Googled mm. how do I mitigate risk, what would come up? So mm. this is what I want to bring on. There's five things that I want to bring up here. One of them is diversification. Yep. Now it says, you know, basically they say one of the most effective ways to reduce risk in the stock market is to diversify your portfolio by investing in a variety of different stocks, bonds or other types of assets. So obviously the stock market is just different stocks to reduce the impact of any individual stock's performance on the overall portfolio. So we yeah. agree with that, don't we? Yeah, but now the risk, point, the risk of you talking too much has just gone through the roof right now because you love this topic. I do. Mm. But I'll shut up and let you talk. No, I wasn't going to talk. Well, we talked a bit about it, okay? So we're saying 8 to 12 stocks, that's all you need. Yeah, so we've already right. talked about it. So we agree with diversification, but not to But not to the point of trying to diversify outside mm. of markets just because the industry tells you that's what you need to do. No, and that's what, oh, one of the stock market reports I did earlier on in January, I talked about um, investing off offshore, that myth that you need mm. to invest offshore and how poor that is mm. and how that if you did that, you would, your turn would be worse. Mm. And in my book, I talk about diversification, which is over-diversified portfolios and how yeah. that dramatically affects your portfolio. But we do agree with diversification that you need to do it and you need to do it properly and it's not hard. Anybody can do it. Well, when we're looking at a portfolio, we're thinking about, okay, what are the sectors? So, for example, if we're looking at, yep. at the Australian market, 
So we're talking about portfolio construction here as in the stock market as opposed yes. to um, looking mm -hmm. at diversifying across property and shares and all those things. So with mm -hmm. the um, investments in the stock market, it's about well thinking initially that you may decide to have stocks in different sectors if the, if these mm -hmm. sectors are running, not just because the the market ha is heavily weighted into financials and materials you'd have what we talked about on the show yep. recently. Yep. Um, but more about the fact that, um, mm -hmm. you know, if we invest, if we're going to invest in financials and the financials is running, then we're probably going to have quite a few stocks in financials rather than just thinking I'm going to have one or weighted according to the financial sector. Yes. Same with materials. If it looks good and we're studying those stocks and they tick all the boxes and they're, they've got, they're in the right, um, you know, index for what we've set as a criteria for our portfolio, then we may look at those. Yep. But we might have, you know, four or five different sectors that we're, ex we're getting an exposure to, but we might only have three, mm. depending on what's running at the time. Mm. And I know one of the critical things that we do in diversification is to really set a foundation for the portfolio, not just have like high risk stocks in it. We set a foundation in yeah. that portfolio to diversify the baseline, like four or five stocks that are good stocks that are not going to be subjecting us to lots of volatility that could risk a lot of downside risk, et cetera, and then start adding stocks on that can increase the profitability of the portfolio and get more volatility mm. into it. So there's lots of ways to diversify a portfolio. So, and we do talk about that in, in my books and obviously we talk about it in podcasts. Yeah, because when stuff. we're constructing a portfolio, if we can put mm. money into some of the banks or financials, we'll all, we're always going to do that we're gonna, for any yeah, type absolutely. of portfolio mm. because we'll get some growth and – and dividend income from them. Mm. But then if we can put them into, like you say, some of the other growth areas, you know, materials, if we can put some money into the different, like you talked about the tech sector, there's a time and place for, yep. for that one, but it's more cyclical. So we're, we're going to leave that out until that area starts running again. But looking at the stock specifically, not waiting for someone to say that now's the time to be buying lithium or, okay. or tech stocks. All yeah. right, now I'm going to bring one up that might be a little bit of controversy. But so you can get your boxing gloves ready. Oh. Um, long-term investment horizon. It's important to have a long-term investment horizon when investing in the stock market. Mm. This allows you to ride out short-term market fluctuation and reduce risk of selling during a market downturn. That's just absolute bollocks based on what we know about cycles in the stock market. Yeah. And that's what's yeah. killed a lot of people in the GFC when they got hit because yep. – they had no idea. I can remember prior to the GFC, mm -hmm. um, there was a, a big financial company, which I think may have even been taken over from our stock market, but um, they used to have a linear graph that would just yeah. show it going straight up off, um, you know, yeah. uh, compounding returns over time and it was a straight line. Yeah. The stock market doesn't move in that way and, no, and people doesn't. got the hard lesson of that, forgot about the 87 crash. Yeah. Because that's what happens in every market cycle towards the end. Everybody forgets Talk about to the retirees in 2007, 2008, 2009 who couldn't retire or had to keep working. Yeah. Because their portfolio had fallen out of bed. Mm. To me, you should have, you should be thinking long term in terms of not, I'm not talking about the, the long term in terms of each individual stock you buy, but long term in being a consistent long term investor in the marketplace where you're consistently doing something mm. over a long period of time. And building your portfolio and being active in it, yeah. not actually buying BHP thinking I'm going to hold that for 10 years or 20 years. Exactly. Because every stock will have its day in the sun. Because we can mark a line in the sand and say, okay, if we if we drew a line in the sand today and mark 10 years, for, we could tell you whether there was a high probability there was going to be a correction mm. at mm. that 10-year point. So Yeah. Um, now, here's another one, number three. So we've got diversification, long-term investment horizon. Mm -hmm. Number three is one of my bugbears, dollar cost averaging. Oh, and yes. we constantly get people throwing that at us, even on our yeah. you know, on our YouTube channel, people saying, oh, I want a dollar cost out, DCA this, DCA that. Mm. People talk about DCA and I'm thinking, don't come anytime, mm. you know, to me is DCA. But dollar cost averaging, what they say is this strategy involves investing in fix, a fixed amount of money regularly, regardless of market conditions. This helps to reduce the risk of investing a large sum of money at the wrong time and can lead to a lower average cost per share over the long term. And I almost throw up just saying this stuff. It's just rubbish. Mm. Yes, you'd regularly, regularly put money aside for investing, but it doesn't mean you should put it into investment 
on a regular basis. As soon as you've got it. As soon mm. as you've got it. It's okay to put it in a bank account and sit back and wait well, for the right Well, that's why a lot time. of people went into that dividend reinvestment plan thing because yeah. it's just that's a forced saving sort of thing. Dollar cost averaging is, can I say it works, but it doesn't work. It holds you back a lot. It hold, it, it means it's, you don't get as good a return as if you don't dollar cost averaging because the market will have two dips a year. It will. The market has a major dip every so often and so it's about understanding when's the right time to invest so dollar mm. cost averaging is not really something we want to be involved with mm. so i will say if somebody is dollar cost averaging i'm not it's not the worst sin of all mm. like i'm not gonna go oh you know you know you shouldn't be doing that and i don't think you should be doing it. i'm just saying it it doesn't work as well because how often do we bring up stocks that mm. are the same price that they were 10 years ago and people just buy all the way up and all the way down. They go, well, I've averaged my price lower. And I go, yeah, but you're still not making any money. Mm. So, and you know, we've seen Telstra go down for 10 years. We've seen other stocks go down for a long period of time. And why, to me, if you're dollar cost averaging on the way up, it's not as bad as seeing as dollar cost averaging on the way down. Because why would you keep buying something that's losing money? Yeah, I know, but we but it seems like an easy way to do it. And we haven't really talked to people What's about a when to buy because that's, See, that mm. makes them think that they don't have to worry too much about when to buy. They just buy it Correct, when they've got that, the money. Correct, but that serves the big end of town. That serves the brokers. That mm. serves the big end of town in the managed funds. They're just More give trades. Me, just give me money every month. Mm. Don't care about what the market is. Just give me money every month and I'm getting commissions on that and my brokerage fees and my mm. you know, management fees and everything. Well, now, I mean, you've got a lot of brokers who are, um, you know, they're lending, they're able to lend the stock out. So depending on the type of account that you've got mm. or the type of broker, um, you've got to really check that. I know with um, certain brokers like Commonwealth Bank, the shares are yours, they're in your account, but yep. with some brokers that's not the case. Yeah, I look, I totally agree with you. It, it isn't the case, you know, so make sure you pick the right broker for you to work for you. So here's another one of these strategies to mitigate risk that they push out. One of, it, this one's a big one, avoid market timing. They say trying to predict the direction of the stock market is a risky strategy <coughs> and often results in poor investment decisions. Instead, focus on a long-term investment strategy and avoid making impulsive decisions based on short-term market, market fluctuations. Look, short-term market fluctuations is one thing. You know, it depends what time frame we're talking yeah, over. I know, but they when they use examples mm. of it, like... You know, if you weren't in the stock market on the 10 biggest days at rose, your return would substantially oh, okay. be reduced. Well, that's I always... just doesn't help anybody. It doesn't help anybody because mm. I go, the market doesn't crash up, does it? Mm. And if you're not in the market, and we've proven time and time again, if you're not in the market on the 10 worst days, your return will be infinitely better than not being in the 10 best days mm. because the bigger moves are down, not up. Mm. Um, and so it sort of disproves that. But... When you talk about market timing, they're thinking we're saying as market timers, because that's mm. what we do, mm. and people are asking us to predict the market and the timing of the market. Mm -hmm. But we're not talking about trying to find the bottom every day or even within a week, but it's around about the lows and it's around about the It could the be highs. three months yeah, before you can months. That's confirm. Not, so it's about understanding the market does go up, does go down, mm. but having some rules around that. So to me, whilst I don't propose – propose people try and pick the bottoms and pick the tops. I'm just saying use some rules to get so you know that the direction that we were talking about, you know, mm. make sure you got the direction right and you're fine. But if the direction's up, buy. If the direction's down, mm. don't buy. Mm. Get out. So market timing, I don't agree with what they're talking about there. But if people have some strategies that are just real simple, which mm. we talk about in the books and we talk about it on our podcast and we talk about it in our yeah. You know, shows on YouTube and on Talking Wealth and we talk about it all over the time. There's some really easy rules. Mm. They can time their entries in to and out of stocks and do so much better. But, you know, people think about timing, but is that really timing? Well, it's being an active investor to me. Mm. And the buy and hold people will be saying it's market timing, won't they? Mm. That's what they'll be saying. They'll be, it's market timing, it's market timing, it's market timing. Mm. So that's what they'll be telling us, but it's not really market timing. Is it in our book? No, but it's really. okay. But that's what they'll be telling us. Mm. Okay, so I'm going to say another one here. So I'd limit individual stock exposure. This is another one that I've picked up from the web. It says investing a significant portion of your portfolio in a single stock is a high risk strategy. Limit your exposure to individual stocks by diversifying your portfolio and allocating your investments amongst a variety of different stocks. I love that one. Yeah, we've talked about that. We've talked a bit mm. about that. So 
basically how do you minim- mitigate risk? And we've talked about diversification is one reason. Mm. That's a, a real primary one that you can do. And then having that eight to 12 stocks in your portfolio gives you enough in a stock that you can profit. Mm. Because I, how many times have you seen a portfolio of somebody that's got a stock that they've got almost nothing in, mm. so it can go up 100% and not really change the so portfolio. The or they've got so much money in another stock that when it goes down 10%, it takes out half of their portfolio. Yeah. So it's about having that right diversification. So you've just got enough in each share that when they do go up, they do mm. move your portfolio value up, but when they go down, they don't kill you. But you could look at a portfolio mm. at different times and the weightings are going to be different from what you were intending at the start, depending mm. on how the stocks move. Yeah. And I know that, I mean, obviously we've talked about these other things like long-term dollar cost averaging, mm. market timing, blah, blah, blah. But the two things that we talk about with people that is anybody, even an eight-year-old can do, mm. is diversification. Mm. And the second one is stop losses. Mm. Always, 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 always have an exit strategy. Mm. And it's so easy to set stop losses. And I urge you to actually look at them, whether you read my book or you hear us on our podcast or watch our YouTube videos or whatever we're doing. Mm. Make sure if you're going to buy a stock, make sure you have an exit strategy set before you go into it because that's the best risk mitigation strategy you'll ever have because you know there's a line in the sand of where you're going out. Mm. And don't think about it that you've lost money even though you might put in $1,000 and the stock goes against you and you come out with 900, mm. don't worry about it. It's better than losing 500. That's right. You know, and so always, mm. always have that. Do you want to add to that at all? Before yeah, because I was just thinking of someone's portfolio that mm. was um, when they came to us, they'd had a number of stairs, shares across really good shares that at particular times you would be wanting to buy those shares. Mm. But one of the shares in their portfolio was a retail share. Yeah. And it actually plummeted. So the, this portfolio had been constructed by a broker and they tried to get diversification across different stocks in different sectors, um, which is fine, but not to just sort of like we say, not to just think, well, I've got to have some in the retail space. And anyway, they had, and the retail was were falling away. Well, they lost about 50% or the stock was down 50%. And she was trying to say to me, oh, well, I'm getting profits on the other shares. I said, yeah, but what if some of those other shares start falling away? You've got this retail stock and then you get the other stocks falling away, you've, you've got nothing left you've then. You've got nothing left, mm. you know, and people do do that, don't mm. they? And to me that's where you've got to have, if you if a stock's good enough for you to buy it, then it's good enough for you to make sure you've got an exit strategy. Mm. Um, and the I yep. don't know doesn't cut it with me, you know, mm. and it's like, and, and some people turn good trades into long-term investments because mm. they pick the wrong thing and it's not that you're wrong. If you get stopped at, it's just because that's the market. The well, market I, I decided that. I think some that. really good examples where people became yeah. complacent was with the banking shares. Oh, yeah. And then the banks fell significantly the following years. the Royal They're Commission all, all that plus. time. Yeah. yeah. So I think there were a lot of people talking about dollar cost averaging then to try to make up for what they were down at the time. But it's still wrong strategy. Mm. Dollar cost averaging for five years? Yeah. Please. That's definitely the wrong strategy. But mm. I think one of the most important things that you said was right near the start of this podcast. If you know, basically, if I can't paraphrase what so you said, you're saying but I said something right. You said something really brilliant. But <laughs> some to me is if you're going into the stock market, you need to expect that you're not you're going to get a loss. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And if you're going into the stock market and you don't expect a stock that you're buying to fall away, then you shouldn't be in the stock market. Mm. And that's understanding risk. If yes. you understand when you go in that you are taking a risk that your money will fall away. If you're not comfortable with that, if you can't say, well, if the stock falls 10%, I'm okay with that. If it mm. falls 15%, yeah, I'm going to get out. If falls more than that, I'm already out. Mm. But if you can't handle a stock falling away from your purchase price, then or whatever stop you. Or you whatever know. you put yeah. into it. Mm. But if you can't handle that, then don't go into the market until you can handle that. Yeah, because the worst time, obviously, is when everyone thinks that the stock market is not going to stop yeah. and people are loading their portfolios up with shares, no stop losses in place, mm. and then the market pulls back and then they're thinking, well, it's got to go up again uh, yeah. because everybody's saying that they're cheap now yeah. and the stocks start to go up again. But then, you know, we saw that during the GFC. Yep. People were, you know, faced with a risk on all of the shares in their portfolio, not just a few, yep. and that really rang home to a lot of people about the they need did. for those stop losses. So I think when people think, okay, mm-hmm. the market will just go back up again, it doesn't always do that. And it's right Not when you time expect you want it. Yeah, and it's right when you expect that it'll keep rising, that it will fall. Well that's a good question. And when you see mm-hmm. somebody says to you, 
I go, why did you buy that stock? And they go, oh, blur. And they go, oh, it's all right. I'm not selling it. It'll come back to her eventually. And I go, how long's eventually? Yeah. And do you want to wait five banks. years, 10 Some years, of the banks are trading years? at the same price they were. 10 oh years ago. Gosh, yeah. You know, NAB definitely mm. and, and others are definitely trading that. So when mm. and what could you be? But you mentioned in, in another podcast is that opportunity mm. risk. If you're in something that's going nowhere. You've got some cash to put into something else. You might as well have your cash and put it into something mm. else that is going somewhere because mm. otherwise you're just or losing. Or just sit and wait until yeah. there's something better. It's the risk mm. of not investing as opposed to investing. So, mm. but I mean, as I said, to me, remember the stock market really does involve risk and there's no guarantees that when you buy a stock mm. that it's going to make you money. You hope it's going to make you money. You might have done your research, so all, but you need to plan for the worst mm -hmm. and, you know, hope for the best, yep. um, which is what you were talking about a bit earlier about, you know, the risk has a two-edged two sword. The risk of not investing is also there as well. Mm. So, but you need to have a, a really nice defined strategy and we can give you that in our books and whatever else. But really, I think, you know, we've covered risk uh, Fantastic. Unless you want to add something to that? No. You I'm, want to start I'm another really argument or anything like that? Oh, I always love those. Yeah, or should I say discussion. <laughs> but not cool. right now. All right, well, that's it from us here on Talking Wealth. You've been listening to Talking Wealth podcast here with Janine Cox, a senior analyst at Wealth Within and a mentor of our traders. And I'm Dale Gillum here, the chief analyst at Wealth Within. Goodbye, good luck and good trading. <laughs>